Gallaudet University presents. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to our final VL2 lecture for this academic year. We have truly had an amazing year of lectures on a variety of topics. But I would like to say that we have indeed saved the best for last. Today we have the wonderful opportunity of welcoming to Gallaudet one of our own. She is an alumna. Dr. Erin Wilkinson. She received her master's in linguistics from Gallaudet University. And I believe there was an article published in the Winnipeg newspaper that was talking about Erin's passion for linguistics. And I think that that's what we're gonna have an opportunity to see today. She studied a number of different languages, sign languages, She was a student with VL2. She did her pre-doc pre fellowship where she wrote her dissertation. And so we were really honored to support her in her work through that. She was a graduate student at the University of New Mexico working with Jill Morford. They were working on some very important and groundbreaking research focusing on the, how the brain processes reading second languages, which I believe is a very important piece of research for VL2 as well. So we want to applaud her work with us on that. I don't think she's going to be talking about that today, as I've seen the topic that she's presenting on. But I am very much looking forward to what she is going to be speaking on today, because it looks like a very interesting topic. You can see the topic here on our PowerPoint. Her presentation today is called Unlocking the Grammatical System of Self. So right now I'm looking very much forward to hearing about that topic. I will welcome Erin to the stage. Thank you for being here today with us. Thank you. Feeling a bit out of sorts right now given that I can see myself on a TV screen across from the stage. I'd like to start by talking about my involvement with VL2. As a center, it is, by its name, focused on visual language and visual learning. What I'll be presenting today focuses on the visual learning part of that center. I also understand that those of you in the audience may come from a variety of educational backgrounds, so I'm sorry if this isn't quite in line with what you already know of linguistics, but I still think that what we have to talk about today can be relevant regardless of what field you're in. Over the past, de over the past 30 or 40 years of linguistic research, we have uncovered a great deal about the properties of ASL but still, there's much more to learn. What I'll be presenting today is the result of a project that I was actually quite reluctant to undertake. I had to do this as part of a class project. When I was a student at the University of New Mexico, a professor assigned me this topic. So while I was not all that enthused about having to do this research, I am now forever grateful because it sent me on a path that I've been very passionate about and it's one that I never would have thought that I would have pursued. As I give the talk today, I want you in the audience to think more about the big picture of what this contributes to. Think about what you do know about ASL and think about what this presentation means in terms of how much we don't know about ASL. All right, so we're gonna get right into it. I'm going to make you make a decision. You're going to see three, question, or three statements presented with one distinction across the three. And you are going to have to make a decision as to which of these sentences is grammatical. Okay? 
So keep your eye out. There's one sign that will change across these videos. What do you think? Does anyone need to see the video again? No? Who thinks that the first comment was acceptable? The second and the third. Show of hands. Oh, OK. One person's remarking that they don't have a preference for any of the three. But I saw most hands go up when I asked about statement number two. What leads you all to this grammaticality judgment? How is it that users of a language know which is the right word to use in a given sentence? The fact that there are preferences even in this very room tells us that there are distinctions between different forms of self that we see used in ASL. And I'll start by talking about these three forms of self and actually pointing out that the way in which I've labeled each of them is simply a coding system for me to undertake this research. This is not to say that those of you in the room need to refer to these signs in the same way. These labels are also not intended to serve as an interpretation of a correct way to uh, translate these signs. So some of you in the audience may already take issue with the labels that I've used, but they are simply labels for me to keep track of how to research these different forms of self in ASL. One of the motivations behind doing this study of these different forms of self has to do with a general assumption in the field of linguistics, that if multiple forms of a lexical item exist, there must be a reason for it. And there must be differences behind these forms or behind why these forms are used. So we need to get at what the meanings are for users of a language and what rules are at work in determining which form to use. Show of hands in the room, by the way. Who's a linguist in the room? Oh, just one or two. Okay, the rest of you are not uh, coming from a linguistic background. <clears throat> well, this is okay. For those of you that aren't coming from a linguistic background, over the next hour, I want you to think more broadly than simply the discussion about the forms of self. Think about how this contributes to your understanding of how ASL works, its grammar, its rules, different forms, because we certainly don't have a thorough understanding of ASL. In many ways, we are merely beginning to scratch the surface, and this is one indication of that. Some of you in the room may be more familiar with how the term self is used in English. Most of us, having grown up in the US, have taken at least 12 years worth of English. So we may have a more robust ability to analyze how English uses self as opposed to what we understand of how ASL uses self. The other thing I'd like you to keep in mind has to do with variation. As was mentioned, I'm now working in Canada. I've been living there for three years. And I never really thought about Canada and their use of ASL resulting from how much research we have done on ASL. Canada is a part of North America. People there use ASL. There are also places around the world where ASL is used, but I won't be discussing those populations. But I have given a good deal of thought over the past few years as to what any variations there might be across Canadian use of ASL and 
use of ASL in the US. And uh, a lot of this, these questions have been very interesting, but they're ones that I haven't necessarily pursued. My data collection was corpus-based. Some of the items in the corpus were just examples of naturalistic data, where conversations between two or more people were recorded. And then input into a repository for us to use for analytical research. There are a variety of repertoires included in the corpus. Some are elicited narratives, some are um, naturalistic conversations, and then others are uh, narratives that we elicited where we had people repeat well-known stories. There are also monologues in these corpora. Some are monologues that were given as part of a presentation, and then some are monologues that occurred in video blogs or vlogs, which is a new form of data that we have available to us now given new technologies. And then a final type of data in the corpora were two-person conversations. I also need to give you a quick rundown on some background on existing research on the topic of how self is used in ASL. <clears throat> some of you in the room may be familiar with the Green Book, which is one of the earliest and most widely used textbooks for teaching ASL. The sign self is addressed in this textbook. It's also addressed in later linguistic analyses but the basic thrust of both of these, the textbooks and the linguistic analyses, have to do with the parallels between using self in ASL and using self in English. And that's pretty much the extent of it. However, there's a more recent study by Kulita Brova who, have found, who has found that the traditional description of self is really incomplete. She actually happened to be doing her work at the same time I was doing my work, and we didn't know that the other was doing something related. And interestingly, interestingly enough, we both came to a shared conclusion, which is that self is better analyzed as an emphatic marker as opposed to a reflexive pronoun. And again, I came to the same conclusion, so I agree with the uh, conclusion of analyzing self as an emphatic marker and not a reflexive pronoun. This brings me then to uh, the first study that I'll be talking about today. I wanted to start by creating a more complete characterization of self, what the grammatical functions were seen in that category, and then if there's more than one grammatical function, what is the primary of those functions? And here's the answer for you. It's pretty obvious as to which form is the most frequently occurring. On the far left, you see tokens in which self is used as a reflexive pronoun, in the center where it's used as an emphatic marker, and then on the far right where it occurs as part of a formulaic sequence. These numbers are from 15 hours of ASL discourse I counted each of the instantiations of self and came up with 131 tokens of self and then further analyzed the way in which these tokens were used. 80.9% of all tokens were used in an emphatic way. Only 13.7% by contrast were used as part of a reflexive pronoun. So this distribution is quite interesting in how much it differs from what you would think 
according to that traditional analysis of self-serving as a reflexive pronoun. This information offers a contradictory view that it may be best to discuss self as an emphatic marker that can sometimes be used in the reflexive. For those of you in the audience that aren't sure what I mean when I talk about emphatic markers or reflexive pronouns, I'll give you a little primer on what these two terms mean. The key aspect in these constructions are the verbs. On the top half of the slide, the verb that I am making an example of is the verb to see. See is a transitive verb. And this has a semantic role in that you need to have an object after it. So for English, there's the syntactic role of transitive verbs requiring both a subject and an object. This could result in a sentence like John sees a bird or John sees his son. Now let's say though that John is looking in a mirror and sees his own image. We need to say what John is seeing. So English's way of solving that issue, of solving that problem and filling that role of needing an object is by using a reflexive pronoun so that we can say John sees himself. And this relationship between the form and the function means that John is seeing his own image in the mirror. Now there are many other verbs that are not transitive. For example, an intransitive verb like sleep does not require an object. We can add an adjective and say that John sleeps well, and the terms that come after an intransitive verb offer supplementary information, but they're not required pieces of the sentence. So this gives us an understanding of how reflexive pronouns work in English. And this one will demonstrate how they can be, how self can be used as a reflexive pronoun in ASL. We have an example of Patrick Graybill saying that he will see himself on TV. And the requirement of the use of self is motivated by using the transitive verb see. One difference though in this sentence and the one that we just saw for English is that in ASL, an overt subject is not required like it is in English. But this is the best comparison of at least showing that sometimes use of a reflexive pronoun is required by the verb that occurs before it. But as I showed you, using self in this way as a reflexive pronoun only happens 13 point, only happened 13.7% of the time in the corpus that I looked at. Another way of looking at how self is used is to see when it's used as an emphatic marker. Bought is, or to buy, is a transitive verb in that it requires something in the object position of telling us what was bought. What we see in this, um, in this example, though, is John himself bought bread. This differs from what we just saw in that someone is placing emphasis on the subject. And this is one way that self-forms are used. Let's say that in a conversation, multiple reference are being talked about. At the discourse level, there may have been so many people that have come up that it starts to become somewhat ambiguous as to who is being referred to. So if you need to clarify your referent and you don't want your listener to misunderstand who you're talking about, then you can use 
self or a self form as a way of emphasizing or disambiguating which referent you're talking about. By the way, the reason that I can't um, show clips of some of these examples is because the items that I'm talking about in these examples were originally on VHS tapes, and so I don't have um, easy access to taking footage from VHS tapes and putting them into a PowerPoint. This is our sample sentence for how self is used as an emphatic in ASL. And the part that you should be attending to most is the part outlined in the red triangle, excuse me, red rectangle, that we see self occur prior to the verb don't like. And the presenter is now signing this for those in the audience who understand ASL, but she is signing this sentence of really Maria Smith, self one, don't like two of us comment. While the sentence would be still grammatically correct without the addition of self one as an emphatic marker, the fact that it is used in this sentence means that it serves some purpose. It's serving an emphatic purpose. Self can also be used as an emphatic in a predicate structure. This example is one in which there is no overt lexical verb. And the glossed ASL sentence reads, my mother herself is a school teacher. So there is no verb to be overtly used in that statement in ASL, but self serves that role. Of course, self can still talk about, or in this case, could still have been used to disambiguate maybe which family member one was talking about who was a teacher. Self can also be used as an independent emphatic. And the jury is still out on this one, but I have talked with other users of ASL who regard this way of using the emphatic as something a bit different than what we've looked at previously. That it serves a more pragmatic function of emphasizing that you want a given person to maybe, for example, try something out on their very own. This is also an excerpt taken from Patrick Graybill. And he's using self in this instance to make it very clear that he wants one person in particular to try something out and that he's not speaking of you in the general sense of you. The last example of how self is used that I'll be talking about today is when it occurs as part of a formulaic sequence. It is part of a compound and in that way, it does have origins in terms of its use that are, that are related to how we've seen self used as a reflexive pronoun or as an emphatic. But it has become part of this compound in such that it's part of its own chunked unit. This is what this form looks like, which I'll be referring to as think self. It's a compound between think and self, which can still be understood from its present day form, but it does not have the same meaning as to think for one's self, for example. It has a different functional purpose in how it's used. And over time, this compound has seen a phonological reduction such that there has been semantic bleaching 
and it has now become its own semantic unit of think self, which carries the connotation of a given decision being up to an interlocutor and that they're not being told what to do, for example. This is a summation of those three forms of self and the ways in which they can function. They can all serve as an emphatic, but from the data that I've looked at so far, not all of them can serve as a reflexive. Only self plus and self plus plus can serve as reflexives. However, it's rare to see self serving as a reflexive. The second study takes the information that we learned from study one a little bit farther. I wanted to understand what the interactions were between the phonological forms of self plus, self plus plus, and self one, along with the grammatical functions. I'll try to go through this um, clearly for the audience's sake because I'm not sure how much knowledge you already have about this. Starting again with looking at what we know about self in English. This is a chart that reflects how person, gender, and number are encoded in English. Where you see first person, second person, and third person, that's a reference, a reference to the people that might be involved in a conversation. Singular and plural is the number, and then the column that says neutral and masculine is the gender marking. Going back to first, second, and third person, first is always uh, one's own self. Two, excuse me, second person is you or the second person involved in a conversation. Third person is anyone and everyone else. In English, this is the only case where we see gender marking that we can have itself, himself, or herself, which marks gender. What I'd like to look at is whether or not ASL marks number, person, and gender in the self category, and whether there are other aspects of grammar that are encoded in self. I've used a different set of data for this part piece of my analysis. I originally started with 15 hours of data uh, for the first study, and this second study is using 10 hours of data. I deleted three of the tokens that I identified because they were too ambiguous to be able to uh, classify, but I have been left with then uh, 93, or excuse me, 96, 93 tokens that have been examined out of the 96 that were identified. So looking at singular and plural usage of self plus, self plus plus, and self one. You can see that here self plus and self plus plus do indeed encode singular and plural within their usage. Self plus plus can be used for mass nouns, which can also be referred to as collectives. Plural, you can use self to talk about a, a concept such as ourselves, so you're using self plus in the plural. You can use self plus plus to talk about the plural as well, talking about multiple people within a room or within a conversation. But self one, does not allow you to refer to a specific referent in the plural. This slide is taking a look at first, second, and third person usage of self plus, which you can see, and I think most of us in the room are familiar with the usage of self plus in all three of these domains. Self plus plus, again, can also be used in all three of these areas these areas, and then self one is limited only to the third person. 
you would not typically see anyone speaking about themselves with in the first person using self one or in the second person using self one. As a nod to, to those who are aware of the current debate about whether ASL pronouns should be referred to as first, second, and third, or whether they should be referred to as simply first and non-first pronouns. I do understand that, that argument exists, but I thought for the sake of this study that I would go the more conservative route and stick with the first, second, and third person labels. So I do have a question for everyone in the audience. Are you familiar with the term obviativeness? I'm seeing most of you saying that you are not, and I thought that this would be a new concept for you, as it was for myself as well. When I was doing my doctoral studies in New Mexico, we were studying native languages there. And in one of the lectures, one of my professors was discussing this concept of obviativeness. And I was completely unfamiliar with it. Um, I actually had a faculty member teach me something that was totally new, which was very exciting in the moment uh, during my studies there. But I did want to outline this uh, concept for you by using these two images that I have displayed. So in the first image, you can see three people engaged in a conversation together. And then on the right side of the slide, you're going to see uh, the blue line that indicates uh, a wall, if you will. So there are two people on one side of it and three people engaged in a conversation on the opposite side. And that wall then shows that you can't see the people that are on either side of it. So how would a person use the concept of self if they were wanting to refer to a person that was not in close proximity to them but was separated by that wall or in a separate space? So we have to consider space in our discussion of language. Take this room that we're in here, for example. We can all see each other. We are all physically present here in this room together. In looking at the usage of self in English, it seems that there is not an influence of space on how that it the example of self is produced in language. But if we do then look at ASL, you can indeed see an influence of space on the decision to use the three types of self, whether someone is proximate or in the same room or same conversation as you, or whether they are separate or obviate, which is my next example here. So obviate then is the referring to someone who is at a distance or not in the same area. So proximate would be us in this room, and anyone outside of this room would then become obvious. And so what we're doing here is referring to people that are external to this room in a way that obviates them from our space. This is a feature of language that is used in native languages, for example, Athabascan languages in Western Canada. So this is a linguistic phenomenon that does occur in some spoken languages and is sometimes referred to as the fourth person, but is not something that's used in English. So again, looking at the corpus of data that I studied and seeing the grammar of obviativeness and whether or not proximate and obviative can be seen in the use of self, I did find that you actually do see a difference in the way that those are used. Uh, if you are talking um, in the if you were talking in the abstract about being upset with a coworker who was not in the room with you, you would use self differently than if the person was if engaged in the conversation that you were uh, referring to them in. So it seems that self one is more frequently used in the obviative 
manner in that it's indicating people who are not in the specific pre presence of the interlocutors. So if I were speaking about someone who were sitting here off to my left hand side, I would most likely be using either self plus or self plus plus. It seems very awkward and does not seem to be used very frequently to refer to them in the self one. So that's where you can see here on the proximate side, self one is not indicated as occurring ever. Now I could talk about this at length. I wish that I had several hours with you, but I do not, so I will try and keep it short here. But I did find in my study one interesting uh, phenomenon that occurred. And I think that it definitely needs more focus. You can see in uh, some signers, as they are engaged in a monologue or a dialogue, the eye gaze becomes a very important piece of the conversation. The eye gaze actually is used to refer to a specific location, and then the sign for self is also referring to that same location that the eye gaze has identified. So eye gaze is being used perhaps as the location of the referent to which self then refers. So there are different ways that eye gaze can function grammatically in conjunction with the language in ASL. I would like to show you a video that will give you an example of exactly what I'm speaking about here with eye gaze. Now let me preface this video by telling you this is a Canadian signer. But it is an ex a perfect example of exactly what it is that I want you to see. Once you watch this video, you're going to really be able to see the argument of eye gaze being uh, used in order to establish the location to which self then refers. So let's take a look at the video here and watch for self and eye gaze. Was everyone able to see that? Would you like me? I'll show it to you one more time. So you, you could see there from the morphological level and then also the eye gaze that was used in conjunction with that, it is indeed setting a location to which self is referred. It was completely evident in that video. But now we need to talk about the distribution of self in terms of semantics. How is self used if it's referring to a concrete reference such as a person, a table, a house, a tangible object? as compared to using it when talking about an abstract or intangible object. If you can remember back to the very beginning of my presentation here, I showed you those three examples of how to use self, and the sentence was, idea, the idea is complex. And there were three different ways of showing you how to use self in that sentence. The idea, the, the concept of idea in that sentence is itself abstract. And so the abstractness of the concept idea would influence the way that you chose or I chose to use self in that sentence. And this doesn't necessarily mean that because an abstract referent is used, the self one will be used, or if self one is used, it is always an abstract referent that is in place behind it. It simply seems to have a strong correlation between an abstract idea being spoken about and the self one then being used. You can see the distribution here of how the forms were used between concrete and abstract concepts. The two examples in abstract of using self plus uh, were a little bit of, were a little bit uh, manipulated differently than what you would normally see in that self, the sign self was actually moved to have a different location than it would in its citation form. You can see that the distribution here lends itself to seeing that there is an asymmetrical uh, distribution of uses of self plus, self plus plus, and self one, one, based on the abstract and concrete ideas being referred to in the conversation.
Unfortunately, it's not easy to see here on the bottom of my slide, but if you can see that uh, sentence that is at the very bottom of it, really we're talking about the grammatical restrictions of the form self and how it is used. There's self one is the most grammatically restrictive usage of the concept self. And we can see that that actually differs from self plus and self plus plus. So we get into a really exciting piece here. I think this is the part that I get really excited about. I really love talking about ASL. Uh, I'm sure that we've got some Canadians here in the room which might be pretty excited to talk about this as well. Your ears might perk up a bit at this conversation. So I went to Winnipeg. And when I arrived, I was a little bit uh, out of sorts. I found that the ASL that I used and the ASL being used in the environment were not the same ASL. So the two studies that I had done previously were based on data in the United States, ASL being used in the United States. But there is a corpus of work of ASL uh, in Canada, using ASL in Canada, uh, that That I, that I had to actually clean up some of the data a little bit to be able to use, but um, I did start looking at ASL usage in Canada and looking at whether there is uniform ASL being used regardless of being in the United States or being in Canada, what age you are, what gender you are, what type of uh, language use you are in, what the genre is. And so what I then proposed here was and I have to tell you that I'm going to show you a number of graphs, but I did want to look at whether or not signers use self differently. I thought I would take this opportunity to educate Americans as to where exactly it is that I live in Canada. The red A indicates Winnipeg. Where's Canada? I don't even know where Canada is. <laughs> it's that whole swath of white stuff above the US. I also want to give some background on what makes Winnipeg such a linguistically interesting place to work. It is a relatively isolated city, so there isn't a good deal of influx or outside or outward bound traveling, so the, com the community there is rather insulated. They are not a population that interacts much with um, Americans that are just across the border from where they are. So this makes this community really uh, linguistically interesting. Next, I'll show a few slides, and they're just stills from the corpus that I looked at. One is from 1999, the other two are from 2010 and 2011, and I'm simply showing these stills so that you get a sense of uh, the people whose language was included in the corpus. This corpus will be made publicly available once it's uploaded to a public server. A server. Um, so while you may not be able to find it readily, we can certainly give you access to it. So if you're interested, contact us. We can give you um, a way to access the corpus. We have one and a half hours of narrative stories about six and a half um, hours of monologues, and then nearly 16 hours of two-person conversations for the Canadian data. In the US, we have about two hours worth of narrative stories, almost six hours of monologues, and less than an hour of two-person conversations. And part of this has to do with the fact that when I 
left the university in the US, I was, my privileges to using that corpus were not extended, so I wasn't able to continue to access data from the university in the US that had more two-person conversations. So while there's not um, a direct correlation between the number of hours in each, there's still enough information for us to analyze different patterns across Canadian and uh, across ASL that's used in Canada and in the US. In all, we identified 351 utterances of self, and then we, dis we discarded 26 tokens, uh, either due to being ambiguous or being used as part of that formulaic construction. This left us with 325 utterances of self, 209 of which came from the Canadian data and 116 of which came from the data from people from the US. I'd like to draw your attention here to those numbers that are circled in red. These contrast the differences of using self plus plus and self one in monologues. You see that the difference between the US and Canada in the self one category is 56 to 25 and then for self plus plus 47 and 29. So it, this seems to indicate that Americans have a preference for using self plus plus and self one in monologues over two person conversations. Of course, I do have to acknowledge the fact that two person conversation data for people from the US is rather limited but what we can look at are differences in a monologue. We see that 104 tokens occurred in monologues in the data from people from the US. For the Canadian data, we see just the reverse. Self one is used most frequently in two person conversations. They only use self 20% of the, 27% of the time when it's in a monologue, and just over 70% of the time in two-person conversations, which is a dramatic difference. When you look at monologues, whether they be from presentations or from video blogs that Canadians have created, you don't see such a high proportion of self being used as contrasted with those from the US. Now, as a linguist, I do sometimes take on the role of being a detective or a linguistic detective where I'm trying to figure out the reasons that underlie these patterns. I thought I would look to the type of monologue and separate out when self occurs in a presentation versus when it occurs in a vlog. What I saw is that the, is that self occurred predominantly in vlogs rather than in presentations. You actually didn't see any instances of self in presentations that were given by people from the US. From the Canadian data, we saw a bit more of a balanced distribution. In both cases, though, we see a dramatic reduction of when people are using self plus. But what we're seeing from self plus plus and self one is that there's a different pattern of usage across Canada and the US. I know there's a lot of numbers on this slide, but in the interest of time, I'll try just to draw your focus to a few of them. We calculated the rate of use of self by totaling the number of tokens and dividing it by the amount of time in which those tokens occurred. What we saw for 
American vloggers is that they produced self at a rate of 0.36 per minute, and Canadian vloggers or vloggers produced self forms at a rate of 0.29 tokens per minute. I do have to note that there was a difference in the ages of the vloggers. In monologues, though, overall, Americans produce self at a rate of 0.29 tokens per minute, while Canadians produce self tokens at a rate of 14 per minute. So that difference is almost double. So it's interesting that you see such a different usage pattern across those from the US and Canadians. I'll now turn my attention to the two-person conversations between Canadians. The difference between occurrences of self in the Canadian data and the data from people from the US was really remarkable. And this led me, of course, to want to know more about the reasoning behind this difference. Remember I said that the Canadian data is built from video footage that was collected at two different time points, 1999 and 2010. We saw self one occur only 12 times in the 1999 footage compared to 61 times in the footage from 2010. The total number of tokens in 1999 was 34. I believe that footage totaled nine hours from the 1999 collection. The 2010 collection occurred over the course of, of less time, but occurred, excuse me, of less time, but ended up having more tokens of self. We calculated a rate per minute, not so much as a reflection of actual usage, but just a reflection of the frequency of usage. In 1999, the frequency of self occurred at a rate of 0 .6, 0 0.06 tokens per minute, while in 2010, the rate was 0 0.32 tokens per minute. That's just about a five-fold difference, which indicates a very rapid pace of language change in such a short amount of time. I then took a closer look at the footage that we had from 2010 to further understand this dramatic difference that we saw. On the left-hand side of the screen, I've outlined which conversations happened between people that were of roughly the same age. I also made the same breakdown in the data for the 2010 information. And you can see the pairings between younger deaf participants older deaf partici and older deaf participants. What we saw is that younger participants used self forms much more frequently than older participants. So now, I'm going to put you to the test. I'll show you a video to get a sense of what it is like to count for tokens of self. These two people are engaged in one conversation, and the split screen makes it a little um, strange to have to watch both people at once. This video runs one minute, six seconds, and I want you to count how many times you see a form of self. And if you're really up for a challenge, 
try and further distinguish which of those forms you're seeing. For those of you in the audience who don't sign, um, you'll also get to try this activity on your own to look for the forms of self. To give you a sense of context, these two people are talking about a horror story, excuse me, a, a horror movie that they both watched, and the young woman is telling a story where she, when she walked out of the movie theater, she saw someone in real life that looked a lot like one of the characters from the movie, and it startled her. All right, so let's see how well you guys did. I'm seeing some people say that they saw five, seven, Six, five, eight, five, ten, four? All right, numbers are all across the board here. What do you think? Someone else says they don't know, they didn't see very many, that they were young people, and of course they, they had too many instances of self. All right, the answer is six. Over the course of one minute and six seconds, we saw six tokens of self. This conversation took place over the course of 41 minutes. Most of them, on average, though, took place over the course of 20 minutes. And interestingly enough, a lot of the people had conversations about UFC fighters, and they talked about who was better and who they were fans of, who they didn't like. So, of course, as you can imagine, given that there are a number of UFC fighters, there were a lot of people being talked about in these conversations, which really lent itself to being excuse me, which really lent itself to um, having many instances of self come up in these conversations. Because a lot of people think that it's unlikely and somewhat impossible for that many instances of self to come up in such a short span of time. But when you look further at the topic of conversation, it does make sense um, as to how the sign self came up so often. So here we're looking at younger signers in Canada. And you can see that self one uh, was used much more frequently than self plus or self plus plus. And you see again the exponential difference between the younger signers and the older signers who very rarely used self one. So again, we calculated the uh, frequency per minute and found that the younger signers were, si were using self at a rate of 0.52 per minute, whereas the older signers were at 0.14 per minute. So that is almost a four times difference uh, between the age groups of younger signers and older signers. And again, is quite an exponential difference there. So the use of self one is evident here to be different between the age groups that we were studying. So let me bring it all together for you here. As I began this study, I never thought that I would find grammatical and morpho morphological variation with the usage of self in ASL. And then looking at the age variation, the region variation, and as well the genre variation between the use of self. In narrative, we saw it uh, more frequently, uh, but most frequently in American presentations. Particularly in American vlogs, we saw evidence of the use of self. And there were different types of selves being used in different ways uh, that we could see throughout the various uh, genre types.
One important piece that I found as a result of this study is the fact that ASL grammar does indeed change, and it changes at a very dynamic rate. I'm sure that some of you weren't really prepared to talk about the idea of self for an entire hour, but I did want to take a look here at a broader application of this as well. I do want to thank you, uh, VL2, for inviting me to come present here. Because as we're thinking about our future work and your future work as researchers and research within the language, we all use language, we all communicate. Even if you're not a researcher, you are still using language. So what we need to think about as we are language users is what is our understanding of ASL? What is our evidence-based understanding of ASL as opposed to our assumption-based understanding of ASL? So think about the applications of this beyond simply the idea of self. What other variations are out there that we have yet to study? We don't know. We clearly need more people to be involved in this research to do more analysis and find evidence such as this uh, in other applications as well. I think living in Canada, there's a more political importance to the identification of ASL and the identification of having a Canadian version of ASL being very distinct from the American version of ASL. And we can see definite differences in this study between those two uh, types of language use. But you can also think about this regionally. West Coast signers, do they sign differently than East Coast signers? Do signers from urban settings sign differently than those from rural settings? Does educational background or family background have an impact on it? So that's a broader look at the variation of language use. In linguistic studies, there is some direct analysis of language. But there's also different pieces that are perhaps overlooked when looking simply at a linguistic view that could change the way that someone interprets data. So a psycholinguist might look at different ways that mental processes take place with language. And are we designing studies that will address these different uh, assumptions that we have uh, dependent on our various fields. Those who teach ASL, how much of an understanding do teachers of ASL truly have of the language and for uh, learners of the language as they are, are taught and what implications can that have? Those who are second language learners of, the, of ASL working with deaf students, what implication can that have if there's not a full understanding of the different uses and grammatical changes uh, based on all of these different variations that we've discussed? And this also applies to interpreting as well. You know, if we're, an interpreter is working between two different languages and we have a variety of information there within each language, how can we capitalize upon that without overthinking it too much in the process? And I think that this brings me to the very end of my presentation here. I do, of course, have to give many thanks to my research assistants, Karen Bryant and Dana Zimmer. Uh, both of my research assistants have worked tirelessly on this with me, and I really appreciate all the involvement. I additionally have to acknowledge and thank my participants uh, in Winnipeg, Albuquer Albuquerque, all of the vloggers that I looked at and all of the presenters that I used as well. And I also have to thank the University of Manitoba for funding the research, because without them, this wouldn't have been possible. So at this point, I would like to open it up to questions from the audience. This is really um, a topic that um, is often on my mind because I have to admit it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because I see people misuse it so often and now I have more concrete data that can justify some of my intuitions about how people use self. So just want to start by saying thank you for focusing on this topic. My question though has more to do with the data that you collected 
as a part of a vlog. These are vlogs that were created um, as a person speaking to a broad audience, not as part of a conversation. Yes, that is correct. Okay, because I wonder if that has an influence on it. You said that space seems to motivate whether someone uses self plus plus or self one. And I think that when people are signing in a restricted sign space, like when you're being video recorded, that you do different things with your language than what you would do if you were in person. So for example, I see people um, making this difference in when they talk about someone walking or someone falling, that they alter the way that they sign to accommodate the smaller video space. So I wonder if that has influenced what you've seen in the data. The other question has to do with your comment about, um, about eye gaze, that I think that it has to do possibly with the fact that she's being recorded, that she's using eye gaze to refer to a place that is outside of that screenshot. And just related to video stuff, do you think it would ever be possible to collect data um, from people who are communicating with someone else on a video phone? Because even though they're still on video, I think that you might see different images um, or different patterns because they're talking to a person and not just a broad audience. That's actually a really interesting question and one I had never thought of. But you do have to think in, if talking about a video phone, a person's signing space is still controlled by being uh, contained within view of the camera. And there's also differences you can see uh, with uh, people cr creating uh, vlogs if they're amateur and they aren't as familiar with how to do it as opposed to those who have created a number of vlogs are much more controlled with their signing, they're much more controlled with their signing space. Uh, <clears throat> there's less spatial information included with those who have created a number of vlogs and are very familiar with the process as compared with those who are newer to it. So what type of a transition is happening there? Uh, and if we think of a vlog, uh, for example, does the signer then allow themselves to be seen on the screen? Because then there's sort of a loop of feedback there. If uh, you're signing a vlog and watching yourself on, on, the, on camera as well as recording it, it's similar to the auditory loop that a hearing person can hear as they are speaking. So if the vlog person is signing and seeing themselves on camera, is that then influencing them to change their language and modify it as well? a really good point. I wonder if our whole world is becoming smaller, just like, um, just like when you're on camera. Come on down. Um, hi, thank you for the uh, outstanding presentation. I've got three things to ask and don't feel the need to answer all of them. I just thought that while I was here I would address all of them, but I understand other people may have questions and comments as well. Um, as a Canadian, I really appreciated the data that you showed. Um, it's really nice to see that variation discussed. My comments also have to do with the influence of space on which forms to use. In addition to the examples that you have brought up, I would argue that proximity is something that influences how we talk uh, using ASL. And as a non-linguist, I understand that sometimes my own experience differs from what linguists mean when they talk about real space. I'm talking about actual, physical, real objects in my environment when I am talking with someone else using ASL. So I'm interested in your extraction of data and how um, you pulled this footage. So for example, the one piece that you showed of two people having a conversation and you pulled two parts of it, how did you do that? Uh, really, I would love to be able to uh, film with uh, a head camera actually on each signer so that they are looking at each other and you can see exactly where they're facing. Um, unfortunately, that's very expensive technology and I wasn't able to do it. What I did use is the split screen room, uh, hoping to be able to capture both sides of the conversation. Uh, and uh, just as an aside, I went to a curling tournament last month uh, and I was sitting there with uh, one of my doctoral students who uh, is a hearing student um, and there was a conversation taking place between two young deaf girls nearby us and I wasn't paying a lot of attention uh, but my uh, student actually then sort of elb elbowed me and said can you believe just in this two minutes of conversation that we were observing they used the sign self at least 20 times. 
And so I sort of just tuck those little nuggets of information away for use later on. And that's why I wish that I could just walk around with a camera recording things all day long so that I could use that as my data. Unfortunately, of course, it's not permitted. <coughs> We need people to be volunteers and be willing to be uh, filmed. Uh, a lot of exhibitionists might be willing to um, be on film that way, but uh, it is difficult in getting that sort of permission. And it's the other issue with it is it couldn't simply be my view. I would have to have a second person with another head camera on so that they could be watching what I was signing or what I was looking at um, from the other view. You know, and researching ASL as a visual language and with deaf people as visual, being visual people and hearing people as well. We really want to take a look at how do we exploit space, if you will. How are we using it? I mean, we know that we do, but exactly what type of space? It's still unclear. I think that there are a number of layers that go into that answer. So I think it is a wonderful question. Thank you. Hi there. This is a really amazingly thorough study of different forms of self and usage. And as you may already know, I am very interested in this and its application to interpreting. So um, I see a possibility in our future of possibly working together on the influence of source language intrusion on interpreters' interpretations into ASL. And how using the word the glossed word self in going from ASL to English influences people's interpretations. Because I'm not sure sometimes when, it's, when self is being used in the emphatic way, if I should, how I should convey that in English or vice versa. So let's say, for example, that in English an interpreter hears emphasis placed on a proper noun and someone emphasizes the name Tom, would an interpreter then choose to sign self or self one because it is a particular form of emphasis? I do think that's a really good question. And I think that there are a number of issues that you've raised here. First of all, if we're thinking about an interpreter uh, only in the context of sign language, does the interpreter have a full understanding of the usage of self? It seems that Outside of interpreting, just on their own. not related to interpreting, but just on their own language knowledge, do they actually have a full understanding of the usage of self in sign language and the different forms and their meanings? And if we look at either an interpreted conversation or a direct conversation in sign language, uh, I often will think sometimes when I see someone signing self, I know in my own head that I wouldn't use it the way that the interpreter is using it or the way that that signer is using it. Um, and sometimes it's correct, and sometimes I can tell that there's something just a little bit off about the usage of it. But I'm not sure exactly what's happening in that process. You know, because of course this is, um, you know, in my own conversations I'm working through that, I couldn't really stop and think about that or do a study of it in the moment, but it does come to mind. How is language being used in the source language? Uh, what stuff is coming through into the interpretation. For myself, this is something that I didn't know, and it may be specific to Canada, but uh, oftentimes uh, if you are at a restaurant uh, uh, ordering food, the waiter might say something along the lines of, and for yourself. And I was actually unaware of that usage in English, of that statement, and for yourself, that particular phrase that is used. And I wonder when I hear it, what does that mean? I don't know. I mean, would I then interpret it to be, what do you yourself want to order? I mean, how would that then come across into sign language? So what specific meanings are built into English? What is the intention of that usage there? And then, as you said, I think maybe it might be some prosodic features as well. It's not simply uh, the usage of self, but also the prosody that influences it. Uh, is that correct or incorrect? And when is self used in English? Typically, it's, is it today more used in non-reflexive ways? Do people speak about myself and Brenda? and Brenda? Or how is it used? I mean, that is a really good question. Thank you. Thank you. Was I supposed to stay? Oh, on the red tape. OK.
In your presentation, you outlined the different uses of self as a reflexive pronoun and as an emphatic marker. And I may have missed this, but when you showed the example of Patrick Graybill saying something about my mother herself, and I forget what the rest of the sentence was, bought a car or something like that, how is that different than if he were just to say, my mother bought a car without adding that self marker? Does the repetition have its own implicit meaning of some sort of emphasis? And the reason that I um, am particularly interested in this right now is because on campus, we have an advertisement that's being shown on our uh, campus TV channel, and you see um, someone saying, can you imagine yourself here? And it's really like a promotional material for the university to be used as a recruiting tool. And a lot of us are really feeling like the way that they've said that they've used self in that example of can you see yourself here isn't quite right. And there's something really off-putting about it. And I'm wondering if what you have done here can really shed some light on why so many people on campus think that this uh, promotional video is kind of weird. It seems that if we're talking about that example of uh, my mother herself bought a car, that that is being used as some sort of a, a reference to specify specifically who is purchasing that. Um, and it, it could be a car, furniture, a house, anything like that, any of those examples. Um, it depends on the number of people who are involved, who actually did the, the purchasing, who is the salesperson. Uh, all of that can come into play in the decision to uh, sign that particular statement of my mother herself bought the car because you in that process of discourse have now brought in a number of reference into the conversation and so it's a way of tracking who specifically someone is speaking about or signing about and so it's a little bit of a cue uh, to the interlocutor uh, involved in that dialogue about let me redirect you to specifically who I am talking about and that's when the herself as in my mother herself purchased the car uh, because we've discussed so many other people in that discussion. I often will see the self plus plus sign uh, being used in conversation by deaf people that include a non-manual marker in that, uh, that conversation. So it becomes a pronominal referent there. Um, so if in your example of can you imagine yourself here, there's no referent there. Uh, you can't say it that way. Uh, because self needs something to be referring to, I believe. That's what it seems to be. So I don't know if you could replace that sign of self with simply a, an index to whoever the viewer of that video is. If you're looking at the entire context of how you're referring to specific people in that, I mean, if you imagine that we have a uh, several different people engaged in a conversation. How often would someone use the index as a reference to see to speak about people? You'd want to count how many times that's happening. Uh, and actually, uh, let me give you an aside here. In Canada, I recently went to Toronto as well, but in Winnipeg, uh, they will sign self with this specific non-manual marker which we don't see in America. So what I'm doing right now, what I'm showing the specific non-manual marker of my specific facial expression is used frequently in Canada, but you do not see that same non-manual marker occurring in the American usage of self. So I think that it becomes a very complex question uh, when addressing that issue of imagine yourself here in that video. There has to be other pieces that would play into the usage of self or a different sign. It looks like we have another question. Come on down. I'm another fellow Canadian here in the audience. And something that just occurred to me has to do with geographical influence and language contact. So the eastern part of Canada is much more densely populated than in the western part of Canada. And then you also said that 
from the 2010 data, you're seeing an increase in the number of self tokens in young people. And I'm wondering if that has to do with an increase in using technologies like vlogs, or if it also has to do with educational options and interpreters going there. I also know that different cities have different relationships with the U.S. So in Ontario, there's a much stronger relationship with people from the U.S. than people in the westernmost parts of Canada. So I'm wondering if you think that there's a geographical impact on this change that you're seeing? I think that is possible, but I think that there are many features that could be involved in that and many factors that would influence the changes in the use of language in these areas. Um, speaking about Winnipeg, they, even though it is geographically isolated and a little bit more of an isolated community, there is still uh, interaction, of course, via video phones and vlogs and, and whatnot with signers from outside of the Winnipeg area. And I think that you do include, you know, the deaf youth in that as well. And you'd include yourself, huh? <laughs> right? You said you signed it that way. Right. Does my non-manual marker on my mouth here give it away? Right, because in Winnipeg, the deaf community, at least from my own experience, is primarily comprised of people that have not lived anywhere else. So I wonder if there's something unique and perhaps more pure about the language that we're seeing in Winnipeg. I think that it's actually really amazing that just in that one town, in a geographically isolated way, uh, there's, they're physically geographically isolated, but also there's, I'd say a societal level, I mean, the deaf people in Winnipeg do, of course, travel. They do go elsewhere outside of the city, but uh, not, there's not all that often that people will travel to Winnipeg from outside the city. People who travel to Canada are typically going to Toronto or Montreal or some of those cities, but there isn't a lot of influx into Winnipeg. So I think that's another factor in that. Um, could we say you know, that those who do travel externally and then return have an influence on the language? I don't know. I, I couldn't make that statement. You know, one sign that I know that is used in Winnipeg is the sign for brown, and I've never seen that sign used anywhere else. Um, do you have any thoughts on that and where that sign came from and why it's used there? There's actually a lot of lexical variation on that sign. This is another sign that I've seen used for brown. I think it depends on a person's upbringing. This is a sign for gray that I've seen, another sign for gray. But this is what we're looking at here. The study is more about grammatical changes and variations, which is different than uh, lexical variations. So it's really interesting if you look at lexical as well as grammatical and the structure of the language. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about what influences language to change. Yeah, you could think about some potential uh, projects. <laughs> Yeah, I'll definitely be thinking about that. Okay, do we have any final questions? Come on up. I'm not too keen on being on stage, but I thought I would come up here so that I could ask you some questions. You gave some examples about third person usage, like himself and herself, but do you have any examples of itself? Well, so in this, I don't think that the English words of himself, herself, and itself are uh, specifically related to any of these signs for self that I've discussed in ASL. Uh, we're simply glossing them as self, as being reference to a specific person or object. So it's hard to do a comparison because there, I, there isn't really a connection between the ASL sign for self and the English words for its, himself, itself, etc. Okay, great. Thanks. I was just wondering if there was like a tighter correspondence between itself, herself, um, and itself. 
So the other thing I was wondering was that non-manual marker that you mentioned of the uh, mouth movement. That is one that I've seen in California. My family's hearing, but I started going to the, free, the School for the Deaf in California in Fremont at the age of seven, and I do see that mouth movement uh, taking place with the sign for self. So that's just a, a bit of information for you if you want to look into that some more. Okay, that's interesting to know because I'm not particularly fami familiar with the Fremont area or the deaf community there. I know some people that are from that area, but I haven't done any specific research on that region. Uh, I haven't really looked at whether or not this occurs outside of Winnipeg. I simply know that when I moved there, I realized that that was a variation that I was seeing that I hadn't really seen elsewhere. Uh, but it could be definitely taking place elsewhere as well. Great, thanks. My last question has to do with universal sign language, well, actually not so much universal sign language per se, but um, other sign languages across the world. So do you have information from LSQ and other sign languages? I have been involved in uh, looking at various sign languages and trying to de develop a comparison um, of the different forms, similar to the study that I've shown you here. In Italy, there's only one, one form of self. And then I believe in BSL, there are two different forms of self. I'm not specifically sure about this. Um, I, I don't know BSL, so you can't quote me on this. But um, I haven't really looked at universal sign language. It's not as complex as ASL. I think that you're seeing a little bit more complexity here with the ASL structure and system for some reason. Uh, it simply seems to be more complex than what I've seen elsewhere. It's interesting that it just sort of developed on its own organically over time. Yeah, that was a wonderful question. Well, thank you. That's all that I have. And you're going to go back to on Wednesday or something? Is that what you said? No, I'm sorry. I was saying I live in Winnipeg, so that's where I'll be going back to. And the sign looks the same as Wednesday, but no, it's Winnipeg. Oh, that makes sense now. Thank you. I never really thought of anyone under misunderstanding the sign for Winnipeg to be Wednesday, so thank you for that one. I'll definitely make note of that for future linguistics research. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I do believe we have time for just one last question, if there's anything that anyone wants to ask. Um, well, if not, then I myself would like to thank you for such a great presentation. Oh, that's funny to add self in there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. Great. Well, per usual, we have the evaluation form, so please do fill those out. And um, as I said at the introduction, this is the last presentation of the series for this academic year, so keep your eyes peeled for next academic year's lineup, and we will hope to see you there. With that, we will close today's lecture. Thank you very much. We'll see you all soon. This has been a production of Gallaudet University.